bringing our talents from South Beach, as you can see. I've been, you know, South Beach and you know, doing my thing. And anyway, well, she's been inside a lot, but I've been out in the sun, you know. I need to get out more. I get I out at night. Out not, I, I need to like start getting out in the day. I'm turning into a vampire. You are turning into a vampire. It's Halloween, but anyway, <laughs> I hope everybody's doing good. You know, we figured we pop on. Um, our show got interrupted tonight because Virtue is having. Uh, a couple of things going on at home. We hope everything works out for Virtue. It's one of my buddies. I hope everything is good. Uh, we just wanted to pop on real quick and say hello. Hope everybody's doing good. Um, I know we're live right now, so everybody's got any questions. You know, we'll be free to take some questions. Hope everybody's out there. Uh, football, I really don't have – I really – today I only watched one game and, or two games. They were pretty good, I guess. We are sitting here and trying to do this Twitch. Uh, we, we usually talk about wrestling and sports. Congratulations to the Dodgers for winning the World Series. I thought that was pretty cool. Um, the Mets finally, finally, the Mets have a new owner, which is good. The Yankees are scurrying around trying to get – you're trying to figure out how they're going to spend their millions and millions. And uh, what else we got going on in the wrestling world? Um, hey, I what know. happened? What what was good that happened this week in wrestling? You no, know, did something happen with the girls? Well, they had a pay per view last weekend. Right. And remember, I don't really watch, but no, Sasha watch. Banks won. Sasha Banks won. The That's title. right. So Sasha that Banks was something. That was something good. You know, let's talk about Sasha Banks for a minute, okay? Because, you, you know, you, you follow women's wrestling pretty much a little bit. A little bit. I have to say, Sasha Banks is definitely making a name for herself in the wrestling business. I think this is her fifth title win, right? So five title wins for Sasha Banks. Congratulations. There's a lot to be said for being a world champion, you know? And when they give you the title five times, you know, you cementing your way into having an awesome legacy. And that's what she's working on right now. And I think the only one who has more title range than her active is Charlotte Flair. Charlotte Flair. Right. I think Charlotte has 12, 10 or 12 guys. You know, it's funny when you think about the women's title and, and, and titles in general, let's go titles in general and how much they frequently change hands now. Nowadays. Uh, nowadays. But when you were a kid, Bruno San Martino was champ for like what twelve years? Let's see. Champs, he, champs, state champs for a long time. He won it in what nineteen sixty eight mm. from Buddy Rogers, mm. right? He was champ all through the sixties and into the seventies, right? Until he was defeated by who? Defeated by. Oh, wait. Ivan Koloff. And when Ivan, you look... Ivan Koloff broke his neck. Mm -hmm. Ivan Koloff broke his neck. But you get your superstar Billy Grahams. You got your Bob Backlund. They, Bob Backlund had a long title reign. What was he, four or five years? Until Hulk. he was beat by the Iron Sheik. Hulk Hogan. Then Hulk Hogan beat the Iron Sheik. You really had transitional heel champs back then. Where they like would just put these transitional champs in, and then it got to the point where it was always going back to Hogan. Hogan. Well, Hogan. you know, and it, it, there was a couple guys in his stand man, Stasiak. He held the title for 10 days before he lost it to, he beat Pedro Morales. And then he lost, I think he lost it to Bruno. This was in 1973. So there was a title change, I think. He beat Pedro and then he lost it in 10 days at the garden. I don't, I forget who against, who too. I'd have to think about it because I'm so, having a tired brain day. Usually I pop these things look up, out. Look it oh, up. I'll look it up. Look it up. Keep Mom, talking. Right. All right. So there's Ray Pops. He says, You on mute too. You on mute, by the way. Oh, no, we're fine. We're on. We're fine, Ray Pops. Thank you. Thank you. We're on. It'd be weird if we weren't on, but it says on. we're on. The mic says it's on. 
Mike says it's on. You okay now? We, we're on. We're on. Thank you. Okay. He hears us now. Right. Okay. Um, so anyway, let's go ahead. Keep talking. So we're looking up right now. Um, Stan the Man Stasiak, when he, when he won the title and lost the title, I think he beat Pedro Morales. And then he lost it to, we're trying to find it. We're trying to find it. Trying to find it. Okay, Buddy Rogers, then Bruno, then Ivan Koloff, like you said, 1971, Pedro Morales, then Stan Stasiak, then Bruno again. Right. Then won. who beat Bruno? Well, I already won. mentioned it, Superstar Billy Graham. Superstar Billy Graham. And then it went to Bob Backlund, and Bob Backlund held it. But there was also a short little divot in time. Did you know that Antonio Noki actually had the belt at one point? Yes. I from Bob Backlund. And WWE never talks about it. They never talk about him winning. Do you guys know, like, I don't believe that it ever happened, but a Bob Backlund, Bruno San Martino match? Oh, you know what? Did it ever happen? I don't think that match ever happened, guys. I'm going to look it up. That's a pretty good, like, Bob. There's two champions there, old and new. I mean, and everybody knows the Lyra Sabisco feud with Bruno. Yeah. You know, and then the Battle of the Giants, a big John Studd and Andre the Giant. Guess what? It yeah. actually did happen. It did. Yeah. Let's check it out here for a second. Hold on, guys. We're looking up Bruno. Oh, no, wait, maybe it didn't. Hold on. It's it, But it's all over the internet. Who would win between Bruno and and Backlund? That's what I'm saying. Backlund discusses Bruno. Hold on. Who would win? Who would win? <sighs> Very contrasting in styles because Bruno was a Luke brawler, Pat. but Bob was a technical wrestler. Who would win with I Bruno? I think Bruno and Bob? Would, Bruno would pull it out. I don't ever see them. No, Bruno. No, I don't ever I, see. It, does, it looks like Bruno. And Bob Backlund never fought. And you just heard it here, live, baby, live on Getting Called. Why don't we talk enough about Bob Backlund? People today don't talk enough about Bob Backlund. Now, when I was a kid in the 90s, Backlund came back. Because, he, because he did that crazy thing, and I just think it didn't mesh. It tarnished his... His run as his an all-American. Amer all American. So you think it was a mistake for Backlund to come back in the 90s and win yes. his belt? Yes. So his exactly. second title reign, you're saying, was bad for him. Kevin Nash came in at the Garden, kicked him seven seconds. Seven wiped seconds. Him out. Yeah, wiped him out in the Garden. And that was it for Bob Backlund. Then he went a little crazier. He did the chicken wing thing. He pops back up every once in a while, but he doesn't get the same respect as like a Bruno or, or like a superstar Billy Graham. I think it's sad, guys, but like, you know, like when you talk about the greats of wrestling, like a lot of guys don't get their due. Um, you know, and then the same thing goes for guys who are out there. And I get mad about this. I really do. Guys who put themselves over on Facebook, who mm -hmm. never had a run, who, who worked for the company and think they deserve to be in the Hall of Fame. Now, there's something to be said. Everybody starts out as a job boy, right? And everybody starts out as a jobber. I did. Mick Foley did. You know, a lot of people did. Matt Hardy, Jeff Hardy. People forget Kurt Henning did. Oh, yeah, Kurt Henning was a job. Eddie Gilbert did. All these young guys came to, came to the WWF, and they all started out that way, right? But what you fail to realize is when you go from, you know, the jobber status to being a superstar, and being a champion on the top level. Do I deserve to be in the Hall of Fame? Because I had a great run. I wrestled for every single company in the world. Every major company. I had runs everywhere. And I did everything. When I went to the territories, should I be in the Hall of Fame? No. I never ever, nobody's ever heard me say that once. People always say you say that, and you've never said that in your entire life. Like you always tell me, no, I don't deserve to be in there. I was just a, I was just a wrestler, and I did my job. And 
Other people say, oh, well, Vito says he should be. You have a lot of people put words in your mouth that you never say. I never said that. And that's funny because like, you know, but like you never see me post on Facebook. How would you like to see Big Vito in the Hall of Fame? How would you and put my face on like, you know, a Hall of Fame band? I think that is so cheesy. And you're begging. You're begging. Don't beg. It's beneath you. Bringing up jobbers. I'd like to discuss a list with you. I'm not totally prepared today, but I have some notes here. Yeah. I would like to discuss a list with you. Um, there has been several lists that have come out over the past couple of years with a list of the top 10 jobbers. Top 10 jobbers. Now, these are not people like you or Mick Foley or the Hardys that went yeah, on to that. something. Go this ahead. is actual. So I want to see if I can get your opinion on these jobbers and what you actually think of them as far as should they be in a jobber hall of fame or yeah. an enhancement talent hall of fame? Okay, let's do that. Okay. So the first one is number 10, Pete Doherty. He used to be the Duke of Dorchester. Remember him? I remember. I remember what do you think about him? He didn't even have a finishing move because <clears throat> he jobbed so much. He had no finisher. Zero, nothing. Nothing. All right. So you got nothing, nothing on him. All right, here's one that you know very well and have wrestled. SD Jones, Special Delivery Jones. He actually made it to WrestleMania. He did 10 seconds, got $10,000, I think, against King Kong Bundy. King Kong Bundy. He was nine-second loss at the very but first I match. I think SD Jones is in the Hall of Fame. No, no, no. We're just doing the 10 jobbers. It's not about Hall of Fame quality. Oh. It's just what you think of the jobber Hall of Fame. Fasty Jones. I think he is. He may be. He might be. I think like if you had to put it, let's put not let's use a better word. Let's use enhancement hall of fame. Okay. Yeah. Enhancement jobber, hall of fame. The jobber is disrespectful. Yeah. Enhancement okay. hall of fame. I think SD Jones should go in there. Okay. And he and he was trained by Johnny Rods. Right. And he teamed up with Tony Atlas too, if you yes. remember. And Tony Atlas is a Hall of Famer. So yeah. that, I think that kind of puts him up there. All right. Um yeah, and, and actually, they say Jones inducted Tony Atlas in the Hall of Fame. Right, he did. I was I, there. Yeah, I was, was there, and that was 2005. Six. It was six. six. Yeah, it was six. All right. Do you remember the Italian Stallion? He was in a lot of places. He jobbed, excuse me, he was enhancement talent in WWE and WCW. What do you think of the Italian Stallion? Um, he was an old Crockett guy, wasn't he? Yeah. Nah, I didn't think he deserves it. All right. Now, also remember, like, he trained, like, R-Truth and the Hardy Boys. Does that put him anywhere on the status like like your trainer? No. 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 You go by the, by the body of work you accomplished and what you did in wrestling. Okay. What about WCW, the Monkeys, Bill and Randy? The blonde haired kids. I know who they are. Oh, okay. I know who they are. Those guys are very famous because they did a lot of Southern wrestling. So if you're doing Southern wrestling and other kinds of wrestling, you know, it, it depends. If you're putting them in the Southern Hall of Fame, yeah, because they're pretty famous, the Mulkey brothers. Yeah, and they won a match on WCW yeah. TV. They so beat the we'll Gladiators, we'll give them Gladiators. All right, here's another one that you know really well that you've wrestled a lot through the years. Jim Powers. Absolutely, positively, Yes. He was an excellent wrestler, an excellent teacher, a guy who knew the business, who took the time to teach you. He worked for the WWE. He had a good look. He had the body. He had the charisma. He had a tag team with um, Paul Roma. Paul Roma. Mm -hmm. You know, he did get a push. I think they were tag team champions, or they were going to be, or they came close to being. But they had... They were a successful team. They, they were, were out a lot. I don't think they want to title And but. I think that Jim Powers should definitely be in the Enhancement Hall of Fame. And you never hear a peep from Jim Powers. Very quiet. Yeah, very quiet. He shows up at convention every once in a while. He was actually one of the first attacks of the NWL. If you remember in WCW, yeah. they attacked Jim Powers and spray painted him. He was one of the first guys. So, yeah, he's got a, a spot. Here's another one that I know you know and I know as well. Dwayne Gill, who was Gilbert and WWE. But he was Dwayne Gill on enhancement TV, on syndicated TV forever, forever. I He was there, but I never thought he was a quality wrestler. 
He was, um, but would you say he was, I mean, he was in the job squad in the attitude era. So he was there in the attitude area, which was the boom in wrestling. I mean, do you think that that puts him anywhere near an enhancement hall of fame? He's he's at the top of the list. I mean, he had the light heavyweight title too. So you have to think we'll about that. We'll put, him up. we'll put him up there. All right. Here's one just for you. Johnny Rods, who's in the actual hall of fame, but is he the enhancement hall of fame quality? Yes, definitely so. Johnny was the enforcer back in the 60s and 70s and going into the 80s. He was the tester. And that's when you had to go through Johnny to see if you could get a job in the WWE or WWF at the time. And if you didn't pass him, you didn't get you didn't get the OK. So Johnny Rods definitely goes into that category. And he trained a lot of wrestlers, including yourself, the Dudley yes. Boys, Taz, Tommy Dreamer, Big Cass. A lot of boys came through there. A lot of guys. My next one is pretty much somebody that everybody considers the jobber of a lifetime who actually had a short WWE run with a few victories. Barry, I pat myself on the back, Horowitz. You know, she... Should he be in an, an enhancement Hall of Fame for the longevity he's been on TV? Yeah, okay, I'll put him in the Enhancement Hall of Fame, but he doesn't belong in the WWE Hall of Fame. He doesn't belong in the WCW Hall of Fame. He belongs in an Enhancement Hall of Fame. He's not a Hall of Famer, as to say, like, he was this great wrestler, by no means. Here's another one you were tag partners with, Iron Mike Sharp. Iron Mike Sharp actually had a run as a big-time heel and had a manager and was, it was you know, a great worker and believable. And, you know, he actually challenged Bob Backlund for his title. So a lot of people don't realize Iron Mike Sharp was uh, he I he think was Captain Lou was his manager. Uh, probably. I think he was. But he, you know, he had the hand brace. That, remember, he did that. Yeah, he thing. had a gimmick. He, he had, had gimmicks. and So he was definitely one of the regulars and one of the good regulars. And somebody who you believe that will go in there and win. Another um, another guy, he was a, a trainer. He trained Nova, if you recall. Mike Bucci, he trained. Haas Brothers, he trained. So, mm -hmm. I mean, he's another guy. And you went to Iron Mike Sharp's school one time. Do you want to tell that story before we get to the number one job? No, we'll go there. Just oh, you don't want to tell the story? Oh, okay. Well, the number one on this list is Steve Lombardi, the Brooklyn Brawler, who you have worked. And part of the reason that they say that is because of his longevity as enhancement talent. Yes. But also, he played multiple character roles in the WWE. He was Kim Chi for Kamala. He was Abe Knuckleball Shorts. He did Doink the Clowns gimmick for a while. Whenever they needed somebody to appear in a gimmick, they would go, here you go, Steve. Then he went on to be a producer and a talent scout. If agent. there's one guy who I had to say belonged in the WWE Hall of Fame, it would be Steve Lombardi. Because like you said, he did do a multitude of things. He did a lot of characters. He filled in in a lot of different capacities. And there's no reason for him not to be. I mean, he he did his job and he did it well ahead of everybody else. So if you're going to put somebody in WWE, I would put in, I would put in the Brooklyn Brawler. I mean, he's the one that's listed as the top on almost every list. Right. And, you know, it's because he was actually kind of memorable as well. Some of these guys also had great careers in other territories. Like we were talking about, like, uh, the Italian Stallion. He was mm -hmm. a Southern wrestler. He was an old Crockett guy. Um, Iron Mike Sharp had a good career before television cable TV was prevalent. Right. He was around a lot. So some of these guys in their territories were huge. But when they went to, when WCW was a Turner and they went to WWF or WWE, they seemed like the smaller potatoes. And a lot of people don't realize that they were in other territories, just as you went to other territories. Now territory systems don't exist. But back then, they were very prevalent. If you went to, if I worked the last of the territories in the 90s, guys, and I'm very lucky because those are some of the best training you ever get in your whole life. So if you're able to get good training and like you wanted to learn the business, that's where you went to go to learn. And, uh, the lessons you learned were invaluable. The psychology was invaluable. The different styles were invaluable. That was the time when wrestling was teaching wrestling. That's when it was what you needed to do to be a wrestler. Do you think that it is a big deal to be a trainer after your career? Is, is it 
Is that is that like a big thing from back then on the territories? Because it seemed like a lot of these gentlemen went on to either associate with wrestling schools or open wrestling schools. Like you have Iron Mike Sharp and you have the Monster Factory. And that was the places. thing back then. And, you know, if there was more places to go and learn wrestling for guys like that, guys like myself, who could be invaluable to some companies to teach you the basics like that you need and the guys who've been there been to the big companies know how to act know how to eat know how to train know what it takes to be a pro yes it does you know because there are things that other guys can't tell you because they never experienced them they never worked with the top guys in the industry you know so i mean a lot to be, a lot can be said for that now i have a a friend um who has a a, a wrestling a retro wrestling podcast his name is joe and we go back and forth a lot on Twitter. This is a little mm -hmm. bit of a subject change. Um, but we never really pick your brain about this. And I think it's something we should do. Now, Joe, he has this uh, this wrestling podcast, OVP podcast. It's retro wrestling. So check mm -hmm. him out. Um, and he's on uh, Twitter. But we talk about the best year of booked wrestling. The best year of booked wrestling. And I apologize, guys. I know this isn't regular getting color, but it really wasn't some red letter week in wrestling. And I think that sometimes people like to hear about the older stuff, and I'm more versed in that than the new stuff. The best booked year of wrestling, in my opinion, is around WrestleMania 7. Actually starts back before that. I'm going to say from the Survivor Series that year on up to WrestleMania 8, I think is the best. Why don't you give us a year? Uh, 91-92. So you're going 90, 91, 92 that year. So WrestleMania 7, where Hogan was that, champ. I would say that because, was because um, Rick Flair started in 92. Flair started in 92, and he was one of the main events with Randy Savage in WrestleMania 8. Right. So I would say, yes, that's when wrestling was at a high and booking was good, and you had a lot of different things going on. And that is actually when I started to wrestle. That's when I started in 1991 for the WWF. And you talk about at the height of wrestling when it was booming and you had Ultimate Warrior, you had Hulk Hogan, you had Ric Flair, you had the Macho Man, you had Bret Hart, you had the Bulldog, you had the Boss Man, you had Typhoon, you had A, B, C, D, E, F, G, you had them all. You literally had the best of the business. The Legion of Doom were there as tag teams. The Hart Foundation were there as tag teams. Nasty Boys were there as tag teams. Demolition. Um, and they were bringing in like Misawa came from Japan over. There was a lot of big, Mr. Tenru was at WrestleMania. Right. There was definitely a lot of big name talent, but the booking storyline wise was amazing. Right. Undertaker had just debuted. He went into WrestleMania seven, defeated Jimmy Snooker, who was a legend at that point mm -hmm. in WWE. And he just buried him and defeated him like that. You have the tag titles going between the, the nasty boys, and the Heart Foundation, then Earthquake began to team up with Typhoon. There's another big, so tag teams were great. Wow. You move forward, the storyline was great. You had the Randy Savage storyline with Miss Elizabeth that was coming to a close to open up a new storyline into the wedding, into Randy Savage's last WWE, WWF title reign. You had Sergeant Slaughter with the anti-American with Hulk Hogan. They're wrestling together. Hogan gets the belt. What does he do next? There was a lot of anticipation for these matches, the SummerSlam wedding with the storyline, right. Boss Man and the Mountie. Uh, you had Rick Martell and Jake the Snake doing blindfold, old school blindfold matches. But the thing that I think that missed, and I've been thinking about this lately, and you guys are here to discuss, and I'm here to discuss is, did WWE truly drop the ball with a Ric Flair versus Hulk Hogan at WrestleMania 8? Did they drop the ball because they started to build towards it? His first, his first mini feud was with Roddy Piper. If you recall, him and Roddy mm -hmm. Piper went at it. He attacked Roddy at the commentary booth. They were building to a Hogan deal, even had like the Undertaker involved in that, and they ripped his cross off just like the Andre the Giant thing. They did all this. They did rounds of hell shows, but they missed WrestleMania by putting Hogan against Sid. Guys, you want me to tell you why? Please explain, because I feel like this was a missed opportunity. Because Hogan wasn't doing the job to Flair, and Flair wasn't doing the job to Hogan. If you remember, Flair came over the big deal 
former champion, WCW, and he was not losing to Hogan because that was a rivalry. Hogan against Flair. Are you going to see it? Did they want it right away? But neither one of them were going to budge. They were the best in the business. Now, why do you think that Ric Flair would do the job to Savage and not Hogan? Does that go back a ways to wrestling no, families? Guys, or guys, it had nothing roots? to do with it. It had to do with the biggest draw of who were the champions at the time. You knew Ric Flair, you knew Hulk Hogan. Neither one of them was going to go do the job and be beneath each, each other. Everybody else would do the job for Hogan and do the job for Flair. But when it came to that, they wouldn't jump to each other no. because it was years of speculation. If you recall, old PWI magazines on the cover always had who was better, WCW, WWF, and on the top was always Flair, always Hogan. But that then is there why, was Sting, and there was Randy Savage, and it went that way. That's why it never happened. That's why it never happened. So that is a lost opportunity. They could have made a lot of money off that feud. Now, why did they do it then in WCW? Because then it seemed too late. We've already had the anticipation of them being in the same company, a big round of house shows. When he goes to WCW, he starts feuding with Flair right away. They bring Randy Savage over. Arn Anderson comes in. Now they're fighting this way. Ratings. 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 See, I've always wondered these questions because I always found the WCW Hogan Flair feud fell a little bit. I was a huge fan that back then, like huge. But you got to remember something, you as a fan and then what was business, right? And that's when they were trying to get ratings and beat the WWE at every angle they could. And that's when they were signing all the WWE guys to big contracts, throwing boatloads of money, bringing them all over, Warrior, Flair, Piper, everybody went over there. So, but they had to do Hogan and Flair and that's when they turned Hogan heel. Yeah, and right that's after the, that. Right, and they made him the man. So if Hogan did a job and then he goes to the NWO, he just, nobody remembers that. He remembers him joining the NWO, which everybody does. Nobody remembers anything else. Him losing to Goldberg, that was pretty big. Yeah. But when you talk about everything else, guys, Nothing else matters. Another thing I wanted to talk about that year, because I think that was one of the strongest years for mid-card wrestlers. You had the British Bulldog. You had Bret Hart. You had Mr. Perfect. You had pretty strong mid-carders in there. Shawn Michaels had just started his single run. He was a mid-carder. He had Sherry Martell as his manager. Right. They all had these intercontinental championships. Do you think... Looking back now, where Brett was kind of picked as the golden child, he's the one that Flair dropped the title to, um, and he went forward after he beat Randy Savage for the belt um, after that SummerSlam. Do you think looking at those mid-carters at that time that Brett Hart was the correct one to transition? Oh, yeah. I Absolutely. always wondered what would have happened if they would have moved Davy Boy Smith up with his strength, his size. What would didn't have, have the technical ability that Brett had. And the match that everybody missed out on was Hogan against Kurt Henning. And Kurt Henning should have been the next champion when he was doing the perfect. Kurt Henning feuded with Hulk Hogan um, in the very early 90s. The genius was his manager. And they never took it to pay-per-view level. It was on Saturday night's main event. They smashed the wing belt, which is what they used the hardcore title. But they never moved perfect forward after that feud with Hogan. Do you think it's because Henning was so good? Too Henning good. was good, and Hogan wasn't doing the job. Hogan was not doing the job if he didn't want to do the job, and he wasn't doing the job. He protected himself, and that's it. End the story. There's no more speculation. Hogan did not want to do the job to anybody. No. That's it. One of the really, really great matches at that time was at SummerSlam in 1991. It was Mr. Perfect versus Bret the Hitman Hart for the Intercontinental title. I think that's one of the best matches from that entire section. A lot of people don't talk about that when they say, oh, these amazing matches where you think about Macho Man and Ricky Steamboat and, you, and Shawn Michaels and Razor Ramon ladder match. People don't talk about that match as much as I think that they should. That's because... Kurt Henning is not here. He's not on TV doing commentary. And Bret Hart is out of the limelight, and they don't talk about the greatest matches. But if Kurt Henning was alive and Bret Hart was there, and you had to compare matches, what was the best match? I think that match was better than Bret Hart against Shawn Michaels. 
I agree. I think that was a better match. I know they said that Mr. Perfect wasn't at 100%. Uh, he had that bad back at the time, really bad. That's he cut all he his was, hair off. That's because he was, they were messing around with the nasty boys and they jammed his back. I remember. Yeah, yeah and was he was in bad shape and he took time off. But then he went and became Ric Flair's manager after Bobby Heenan said, I can't travel on the road with Ric Flair. He became Ric Flair's manager. Do you think that Mr. Perfect is one of the shining stars from that area going from Absolutely. Intercontinental Champion to the manager of the champion with the whole It's just like the match. Macho Man going to the commentary booth. Right. I so. think I think that within that time, you could get invested in characters. Like when Macho Man lost the retirement match and him and Miss Elizabeth reunited, you look in the crowd and they're crying. People are literally in tears. Then Randy Savage goes to the commentator booth and he slowly face turns while doing commentary, which to me is an amazing writing. He starts teaming and hanging out with Roddy Piper, who was the face at the commentary booth. Then he moves forward that he's going to get married and he's more of a face. That was a slow face turn for Randy Savage. No, but they definitely let you get invested more in your characters then between the vignettes and that it was different. Do you think that would work today if you took a long turn like that from losing the commentary? Do you think that that would work in today's wrestling? Yes. Sorry, that was long winded. You really yeah. think that would that would work? Yes, absolutely. Mm -hmm. You think with today's like people wanting things right now that they would wait for a slow turn like that? Yes, because you're building to it. Do you think that they could invest? People are saying they have a difficult time investing mm -hmm. in the characters. Because you would be, you're investing, you're following the storyline. Right now, there's no storylines. It's two weeks in a pay per view. Remember, there's only four pay per views a year. So right. You so you could build a storyline. You had time to build. One of the characters that debuted during that time was Razor Ramon. Do you think he had the best vignettes then, where he was no, going he to Miami? At that time, he was he was doing an awesome job. He was different. He had charisma. He had the look. He had everything going for him. I think when this run of good writing fell apart was Survivor Series of 1992. They took Ultimate Warrior was supposed to team with Randy Savage. They got in a contract dispute. He's out. They decide to take Mr. Perfect and turn him face and stick him with Randy Savage. That's when people started going over to WCW and stuff started falling apart. Do you think it was the writing and it got cartoony? Or do you think it's because WCW got out the checkbook and started bringing people over? No, just bad booking on that one. I think it's bad booking. Because it did get, that's when you started getting your Doink the Clowns and your TL yeah, okay. Hoppers and the, it kind of fell apart. All right, that's enough getting color for tonight. We have 30 minutes <laughs> That was in. pretty good. I think, hey, I didn't even research. Give me a little handshake. Thank you, Vito, for having me on your show. All right, guys. <laughs> Noel's going to close the show. I hope you enjoyed this uh, version of Getting Color. We'll catch you next week. All right, guys. Make sure you check us out right here on Twitch. Hit that subscribe button down below. You help us keep our programming going by doing that. Also, check us out on Twitter at Magic T Spiller, at the Big Vito Brand. At the Big Vito Brand happens to be where all Vito's social media is. Go check them out there and also on our audio podcast, anywhere you listen to podcasts, Vito. Guys, check us out. Just check us out. Just check us out. Thank you guys for joining us on this live, and we'll see you. Well, Vito will see you back here next week, and I'll see you guys Tuesday night for 90 Day Fiance Group Therapy. All right. Peace out. Bye-bye.